My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer America. Other people are my friends just trying to make you some money. My job's not just to entertain, but to educate and teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. All right, this market spent the last three weeks roaring off its lows. So after a not-so-hot day where the Dow lost 329 points, we were down a lot more than that at one point. The S&P shed 1.01%, but the Nasdaq actually inched up 0.48%. I got to wonder, have we already bottomed? I mean, isn't that the big question? That's what I heard all weekend. For a while, I was operating on the assumption that the recent rally might be temporary, that the S&P would revisit its March lows of 2,237, perhaps even taking out that level. I figured a retest was virtually, let's just say, inevitable. There was just too much weakness in the system all through here. We just knew things were going very awry. But now I'm feeling more confident about the future. I said it this morning on Squawk. I said, I'm just not going to be as negative. Why? In part, it's because the federal government has made some unprecedented moves to prop up the economy. There were some very good things in that $2.2 trillion rescue package. Mainly, though, it's because last week the Federal Reserve decided to go nuclear, pledging to buy the bonds of troubled companies and municipalities. Fed Chief Jay Powell adopted a Malcolm X approach to keep his economy alive by any means necessary. Remember, the Fed Chief has got unlimited firepower. Sure, it's great that the government's providing forgivable loans to small business owners so that they'll keep employees on payroll. It's great that we expanded our employment insurance, and these checks can now be collected by gig workers, too. But for the stock market, what really matters is this backstop from the Fed. Now we know that they won't let every retailer with merely OK credit go under during the lockdown, and that's huge. See, those shares traded like that was they were finished before the Fed's historic moves. That's what I was looking at the restaurants, too. Then this weekend, President Trump negotiated a deal with the Russian and Saudi Arabia uh, uh, to take 9.7 million barrels of oil off the table. That wasn't enough to bolster the price of crude. But without this deal, I think it was headed for the teens, maybe even lower. Now it probably won't go there. The oil industry is a major employer in this country, and the deal with OPEC gives our producers some breathing room. Maybe no more bankruptcies? Plus, it, it also allows the Fed to buy oil bonds if necessary, because now there's some hope for the future, although that'd be a stretch. If they buy Chesapeake bonds, that's it. They're out of here. Crucially, all these distressed corporate bonds are normally in competition with stocks, but with the Fed backstopping them, bond investors likely won't get the bargains they were hoping for. That means more money into stocks, especially ones with good dividend records. By the way, it means that corporate earnings could be higher because companies will be able to borrow at lower rates. It means their stocks might be less expensive than they seem in the out years, especially some of the fastest growers like, wow, what a throwback, Tesla, Advanced Micro, Netflix, all of which went crazy today. When you get that kind of shift, some very good strategists start changing their minds. They don't dig their heels in. They look at the facts. They realize they've changed. Strategists like David Costin at Goldman Sachs, one of my faves, who wrote this morning, quote, These policy actions mean our previous near-term downside of 2000 is no longer likely, end quote. He continued, quote, The combination of unprecedented policy support and flattening of the viral curve have dramatically reduced downside risk for the U.S. economy and financial markets and lifted the S&P 500 out of bear market territory. That's what he's talking about. Not only is he no longer bearish, he thinks the S&P could go to 3,000 by year end. That's up nearly 9% from where we are right now. To me, that price target could be a bit of a stretch, but Costin's reasoning is impeccable, and the guy's very smart. Meanwhile, the lockdowns across the country are finally starting to pay off, even though we're still seeing a horrific number of deaths. We are beginning to bend the curve. Plus, we're starting to get some good news about medicines that could help. It, uh, it, it, listen, this Gilead's remdesivir, I mean, it, it, they got a small study, but it does show that 68% of patients with severe cases of COVID-19 got better. Not a lot, but it's a start. Maybe it's the beginning of a cocktail needed to defeat the illness. That's how it does start, people. That's how it started with the defeat of AIDS. Put it all together, and I feel like we can start thinking about eventually going back to work, although we still need a lot of things to, to go right to happen. Michael Semblis, who is the chairman of Market Investment Strategy at J.P. Morgan, put out an excellent piece today where he noted that it's possible many more of us have had the virus, which means we're closer to developing what's known as 
herd immunity than we thought. Once enough people are immune, the coronavirus has nowhere else to go. That's herd immunity. Testing's ramping too. No, not as fast as we'd like, but Seth and Abbott Labs are both doing bang up jobs. More on the Abbott situation later in the show. If we have medication that can treat the worst symptoms of this disease and we have testing, then we can dramatically reduce the level of fear out there. And that's what really matters to me. You reopen society when we're not as fearful. We're not there yet, but it seems like a more realistic possibility than it did a few weeks ago. Could it be by May? I think so. My biggest worry, though, is that we open up too soon and we see a major spike in new infections. Because without testing for everyone, you can't know who's a carrier and who isn't. And that's why I'm so excited about something that got almost no press. The Apple and Google tie-up. They've created their own totally private, I emphasize private system, for contact tracing, which we know is crucial in order to shut down this disease. I've been calling for a Manhattan Project, something that puts together the finest minds in America to help contain this thing and get back to work. Turns out Apple and Google are doing it on their own. Their their system can give you a heads up if a person you just came into contact with has the virus. You opt in via Android or your iPhone with a free app. The government can't use it to track you. They don't know where you are. They only know that you've been near someone who's sick. Of course, yes, it involves the public health system, but that's all right. I'll give them the information. I think this partnership is huge. It's probably the only way we get contact tracing in America. We're not going to do it the way the Chinese do it. And contact tracing, well, let's just say it's essential to stopping this thing. It's beyond me why more people aren't talking about this amazing partnership between very competitive colleagues. We absolutely need this if we're ever going to go back to some semblance of normal in this country. The system should be up and running by mid-May. Contact tracing may be something for antiviral, starting to get test, test, test. It's coming together, people. You should be more optimistic. Finally, there's one more reason why I'm betting the bottom. It, it, It may have been reached, and that's the charts. Larry Williams, the most renowned technician of our time, points out that we've already rallied 50 percent from the lows. And when you look at the last nine bear markets going all the way back to 1962, we simply don't retest these lows after rallying more than 50 percent from the bottom. In fact, get this, going back to the 30s, Larry counts 20 bear market declines followed by 50 percent plus rallies. And in none of those cases did we revisit the lows after that 50 percent move. Let me show you some charts. Here's the Dow Jones Industrial Average in 62. OK, we pull back hard. All right. Then there's a snapback rally and it's smooth sailing, taking us to new highs a few months later. All right. Why don't we take a look at 1970? We pull back. All right. We rally. Uh, we rally very hard from the lows. Then we stabilize at a higher level. How about the toughest one? 2008. OK, we all knew that this was a bad one. There we go. Pull back. Rally more than 50 percent. Same story. I could go on and on. 74, 87, 98, 2003. If Williams is right and history says he is, then the worst may be over for the stock market. Look, we know earnings season starts tomorrow. We know we have to worry. We know earnings are going to stink. But the bottom line, when you look at the facts, I think there's reason to be more hopeful than we have been. We're still under lockdown. Thousands of people are still dying every day. The economy is still getting hit really hard. But the worst case scenario has been taken off the table. And if Apple and Google can do contact tracing that we all embrace, I know I will. While we continue to roll out more testing, the economy could reopen a lot sooner than we thought even, say, three weeks ago. Oscar in New York. Oscar. Yo, 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 Jimmy Jam. Yo, What's yo. What's going on? Oh, you're, you're probably not going to like this question, but. I am one, um, but it's American Airlines, and I know it has a very poor balance sheet, but some people I know are being very bullish on it. So I'm wondering if it's, realis- if, if it's realistic to expect short-term gains on the biggest airline in the world if they make a once in a post-corona economy, once they start flying again. You know what? I'm not going to go against it. I mean, I was going back and forth with my friend Jim Stewart, and he was saying the real bargains, Jim, are in the airlines. Now, that was a couple of weeks ago, but that stock is all the way down there. I'm not going to be against it. I I, I don't want to fight stocks like that at this very moment, uh, particularly when what's really going, uh, getting blown up are the cruise ships and the banks. Steve in Florida. Steve. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for taking my call, Mr. Kramer. Of course. Um, and also... Thank you for uh, keeping us informed about the virus. I do my best on okay. that one. But remember, so, I am like, you know, I'm just a guy who reads, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I, 
you, sp- you speak a lot of truths, Mr. Kramer. Okay, here's my uh, situation. I have a significant position in Bed Bath and Beyond. Um, like you, I liked it uh, a while before this uh, explosion took place right. here. Um, I bought I bought it at about twelve dollars a share. It's about five dollars now. Is it too late for me to get out? No, no. Look, just hold it for now. I mean, look, the problem look, retail. Retail just got destroyed. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You can't retail, as Manny Chirico said, the CEO of PVH said, retail is not built to close. And that's what's happened. Closing. Now, the stores are closed, not the company. Anthony in Florida. Anthony. Hello, Booyah, Jim. Anthony from sunny Florida. All Been right. Been your show for years. Love it. Thank you. Jim, I have, uh, Jim, I have two sons in NYPD, and they, they nibbled on Micron and AMD. About a month ago, I know you interviewed the Micron CEO, and now it seems like it was downgraded. What's your take on both of these companies? I like both of them very, very much. Now, AMD is just a horse. I mean, I just cannot believe how well that stock acts, but I also can't believe how well the company's doing. And by the way, just so we know, NVIDIA's doing as well, too. I thought the Micron downgrade by Goldman Sachs was wrong today. I don't expect weakness, but I am more optimistic than the Micron analysts. Sometimes it's just about optimism. Nick in Minnesota. Nick! Booyah Kramer from Nick Tron from Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Okay. I'm on to Boeing at $150 a share, so I just had a few statements about Boeing and what you thought about them. First would be that Boeing is planning to cut its workforce by 10% through layoffs, buyouts, and early retirements to meet the requirement of keeping 90% of its workforce by the end of September for the government aid. But Boeing is also starting to resume the production of aircraft as early as today in only Washington with improved safety measures, and around 2,500 right. employees are set to come back. What do you think this means for Boeing? I mean, I, look, I think Boeing had a remarkable move from 90 to 180, and now it's pulling back. Uh, I think it got back to, say, 110, 120. It's a, it's a decent spec. I hate to use that term for a great American company, but there are a lot of things that have to go right before Boeing works, including the FAA has got to say yes to the max. All right, I think there's reason to be a little more hopeful than we've been I also think the worst case scenario may be off the table. Man Money Tonight, being in business for 167 years means Levi Strauss has seen hard times before, from the Great Recession to the Great Depression. So how is the company positioning itself during the coronavirus pandemic, which has been so hard on the apparel industry? I'm going to talk with Chip Berg, the CEO. Then a few weeks ago, President Trump called Abbott Labs' rapid uh, coronavirus test, quote, a whole new ballgame, end quote. But since then, the company's faced a slew of criticism. Is it warranted? I'm going to set the record straight. And the $2 trillion CARES Act is expanding student loan relief. Those of you who have loans, you're going to want to listen to what happens later in the show. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com. Or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.